Thank you. I'm, I'm Lyndon Miller, as they said, and I'm pleased to introduce the third panel of the day, Bright, Eyes, Bright Ideas in Ecology. And before I do that, I just want to say I do represent New Yorkers for Parks. Uh, we're a small organization. We're delighted to be working with many others, and of course, including MAS. Uh, but we are a very small organization doing a great deal to try to help the ecology and the open green spaces of the city. And we really need your help to keep doing what we're doing. And so I appeal to you to support New Yorkers for Parks. Although it is easy to forget standing on the sidewalk of 103rd Street, the land we're on today was once a marsh. Beneath the pavement and throughout our remaining open spaces, our natural ecosystem plays a quiet but essential role in our urban infrastructure to this day. Our next group will discuss ways to balance development goals with protections for the natural environment, particularly in the age of resilience planning. Please welcome our moderator, Julie Tai, president of the New York League of Conservation Voters, as well as our panelists. Good afternoon, everyone. I couldn't help myself, I have to bring my own reusable bottle. <laughs> uh, so, I, thank you for having us today. We're very excited to be here, talk about this very important topic. Um, I am joined by um, three colleagues here today. Uh, to my immediate right, uh, we have Michael Johnson, who is, uh, has a long-standing track record in community-based advocacy for environmental and economic justice. He's a co-founder of South Bronx Unite, an all-volunteer coalition of South Bronx residents, organizations, and allies working together to improve and protect the social, environmental, and economic future of the Mott Haven, Port Morris section of the South Bronx. His environmental activism also extends to his involvement with numerous other, other organizations, including Mott Haven Port, Port Morris Community Land Stewards, the Bronx Council for Environmental Quality, and New York City Community Land Initiative, just to name a few. Next, we have Sarah Charla Powers, is the co-founder and executive director of the Natural Areas Conservancy. Natural Areas Conservancy uses data-driven research to develop innovative ways to manage urban natural areas, ensure things that provide recreational opportunities for diverse users, protect the local biodiversity, and provide environmental benefits. Uh, next, we have Kate Cullingan. Uh, she's a board member of New Yorkers for Parks, um, and she's a partner with HRNA Advisors, where her open space works focuses on enabling communities to create value and public benefits through strategic connections with adjacent real estate and civic assets. Past work has supported programming, funding, operations, and governance planning for Brooklyn Bridge Park, the Seattle Central Front Waterfront, Philadelphia's Love Park, and Oakland's Gateway Park. It is possible we will be joined by Christine Appa, who is uh, with the New York Lawyers for the Public Interest, although she did have, uh, she was running a bit late from another event that she was at earlier today. So, thank you for having us. We would like to start by asking each one of you to describe why the natural environment is important to our communities. Who wants to take that first? Go for it. Oh, well, thank you for being, all of us uh, inviting us to be here tonight, uh, this afternoon, to have this very important discussion. And, and to go into your question a little bit, I just want to tell you about our community and where I live and where we do a lot of organizing and advocacy. Um, the built environment and the natural environment has been in a real serious fight for decades, and the natural environment is losing. And, and because of that, it's the, the effects of that has been really poor health consequences of community members in my neighborhood, where we have high rates of obes obesity, diabetes, and asthma, because the natural environment is losing this battle 
that will provide quality of life enhancements for a community that's um, predominantly people of color and one of the poorest congressional districts in the United States. So I, I just want to start off by recognizing the fact that you know, um, all natural environment access and, and availability a lot of times in our city comes with a cost that typically doesn't happen um, from the top down or from the bottom up. It usually happens with the most affluent, economically affluent, and those who have less have less access. So the natural environment is so important to us because when you don't have recreational opportunities or ability to mitigate storm surge or, or to resiliency of our peninsula, which is entirely unprotected and it's on a 40, in a 100-year floodplain, um, these are things that are not only causing effects on everyday lives, but the potential for future disasters. So um, I'm here to talk a little bit more about how we're advocating for more natural environments to be created and the necessity for those, envir those situations to have access to light as well. That will help them nurture and, and help fend off some of the things that um, we're not receiving because of the built environment. Great. Well, thank you so much for the introduction, and it's a real pleasure to kind of, um, build on the foundation that Michael set, thinking about kind of the perspective of an individual community, kind of zooming that out to the five boroughs. Just wanted to take a moment to kind of set the stage to um, describe where nature exists in New York City and uh, to characterize a little bit about what that nature um, is that we have and then to talk a little bit about sort of the importance, social importance of these places. So um, just to give a little bit of context and I'm also a Bronx, uh, native Bronx resident and I think growing up in the Bronx I really had no concept or perception of the extent of nature that ex exists within the five boroughs. The, by land area, New York City is 40% green, and 10% of that land area is concentrated pockets of nature, um, forest and wetland areas that exist largely on city parks property and National Park Service property, places like Van Cortlandt Park, or Pelham Bay Park in the Bronx, or um, areas of Jamaica Bay. And I think kind of to your point, these are a very much a patchwork landscape that is somewhat static, these kind of residual pockets of historic nature that really tie us um, kind of, to, as Eric was mentioning, to our uh, sort of pre-European settlement past. Um, those places are the primary focus of the work that my organization does, and they continue to be real repositories of a lot of biodiversity and ecological richness. Within that other 30%, we have a really interesting patchwork of things like green infrastructure, um, green space on private property and in backyards, campuses, and also kind of, you know, new in, intentionally placed things like green roofs and green infrastructure for stormwater retention. But we know that, I think, two points really about kind of connecting the social and the ecological. One, there continues to be a lot of disparity in terms of where nature is located throughout the city. Um, and the second thing is that we know more and more how important access to nature is in people's day-to-day -day lives. I think we've had this thought in our heads that, you know, it might be important to have a street tree in front of your house, but when you're going to get like kind of a deep dose of nature, you're going to drive to the Catskills or you're going to head to a national park. Um, and we participated in conducting a social assessment with colleagues from the U.S. Forest Service a couple of years ago, interviewing New Yorkers in more than 40 parks and found that 50% of um, people who were interviewed reported recreating exclusively on city park land. And so I think kind of reimagining what it means to provide all New Yorkers with access to that super nearby nature, the tree in front of their home, the park on the corner, but also thinking about how we invest in and manage these sort of bigger natural spaces within our city so that people who are only having nature access within the five boroughs are really getting kind of a wide range of experiences and opportunities. I really appreciate 
Sarah, your expansion of the definition of nature here, because I recognize that a lot of our day-to-day -day interaction with green is not natural at all. It's actually entirely man-made, but is now growing and a really essential part of the ecology. Um, and HRNA spends a, a, a fair bit of time looking at and measuring the benefits that that green space creates so that we can figure out how do you harness those benefits in order to pay for that infrastructure. Um, now, some of those benefits are not easily quantified, but are essential to the overall well-being that we experience from that access to nature. First and foremost is happiness, probably the hardest one to quantify. Um, but certainly environmental benefits in terms of air quality, stormwater management, heat island reduction, resilience, and I know we'll talk more about that. Um, community, pl providing places for social interaction. Um, health, both mental, recreation, and again, access to better air quality. And economic. Um, when we think about, again, benefits that we can quantify, we can hit some of those um, qualitative benefits and, and demonstrate them concretely. So, for example, um, the Cross Charlotte Trail for, uh, that runs across Charlotte uh, in Mecklenburg County. It's 30 miles of a trail, which in addition to, at its creation, reducing the amount of impervious surface along its 30 miles by 70%, um, with the 1,500 people who have potential to be using that every day, there's potential for burning 94 million calories in a year. Um, as we start thinking about how do you measure and demonstrate the benefits and importance of nature and green space, that's one way to do it. But we also want to demonstrate and measure the kinds of benefits that can be accessed down the road. So from an economic standpoint, recognizing that you know, the High Line in 2011 alone attracted $31 million in tourist spending in New York City. Um, the Rose Kennedy Greenway in Boston uh, is on track to increase uh, uh, adjacent commercial property uh, taxes by uh, nearly double over the course of its 20 year of its first 20 years of existence, and so recognizing the economic impact in addition to the social, health, and environmental impact that green space and nature can have um, on adjacent property values on uh, uh, the adjacent economy provides us a potential tool to come back and look at how do we preserve and grow that down the road. Great, and so actually thinking about touching on two of the topics you guys raised. One is, um, you know, in this age of climate change, and we've all deal with it, we're upon the anniversary of Superstorm Sandy. Um, you know, I, I'm from upstate. I worked for the DEC when we had uh, Hurricane Irene and Hurricane Lee in the same year. That was really fun for all of us upstate. And thinking about how, how nature really plays a role in resilience, and that's both an economic issue, because think about how much money we spend when we're recovering after, after a storm has hit, which is a, a good deal of how we're gonna be dealing with climate change here in, in New York. It's gonna be increases in water and more and more violent storms, uh, and how we can help make our communities more resilient, and why we need green uh, you know, ecologies in order to do that. Sure. Um, so we have worked in a variety of communities that have look, been, looked at how do you introduce green ecology in a way that is going to promote resilience overall. Um, from Norfolk, Virginia, to we're doing work in lower Manhattan a little bit right now, to Gentilly, uh, the Gentilly neighborhood in New Orleans. Um, and in Gentilly, which is a mixed income but very low-lying neighborhood, um, they're integrating new parkland and open space in, or, uh, and as well as residential green infrastructure, which can increase stormwater capture and allow them to bounce back more rapidly from the flood events that are going to happen. Um, and as we look at the potential benefits of that kind of green infrastructure improvement, certainly the increased stormwater retention benefits in terms of reduced damage from flooding and life, um, but also reduce subsidence in the surrounding neighborhood, reduce street closures, reduced health challenges, um, reduce mosquito treatment costs, reduced electrical use for stormwater pumping, um, greater wealth overall by reducing flood insurance requirements. And then the new landscape and open space that's created as part of that is gonna have additional recreation benefits, reduced heat island effects, and increased carbon sequestration. 
Um, and also, through those savings, we'll have significant fiscal benefits that can potentially, again, be captured in order to pay for those infrastructure improvements. So potential fiscal benefits from property taxes and sales taxes that result from this new investment is nearly a, potentially a million dollars a year to the city. Um, and then based on reducing the volume of stormwater that New Orleans Stormwide Management Board is going to need to manage, um, you're looking at potential annual cost savings of $170,000 a year. So the green infrastructure that is part of and can be part of our natural environment, um, in addition to making us more resilient, provides direct cost savings and benefits that we can, again, access in order to uh, sustain that in the longer term. Um, great, thank you. So I think just to, again, kind of provide this sort of New York City um, context, folks in the room are probably familiar with the Department of Environmental Protection's Green Infrastructure Program, which is, for many New Yorkers, kind of what comes to mind when they hear the terms green infrastructure. That program um, is on track to capture 10% of stormwater that falls in New York City on site through the construction and enhancement of um, natural infrastructure located kind of dispersed throughout the city in a way that is really intended to reduce the um, pressures on our stormwater infrastructure treatment systems. And I think that's an incredibly valuable program. I think kind of broadening the thought about green infrastructure away from just intentionally created gardens that capture stormwater to respond to a descent decree, kind of to Kate's point, thinking about green infrastructure more broadly and the whole range of social and environmental benefits um, that are provided. There's a, a huge amount of benefit already being captured. There's a huge amount of untapped opportunity in a place like New York City. And the fight for light and this type of proactive thinking and planning about where are we today and where do we aspire to be in the future in the face of um, climate change, I think is really, really necessary. So we have a lot of ground that we can cover, and I think it also includes expanding our um, our sort of goal setting beyond just things like stormwater to really begin to understand kind of the emerging environmental challenges that are facing our communities as the environment continues to change. In 2018, the United Nations released a report saying that extreme heat is now the leading weather-related cause of death in the United States more than all of the other um, causes of death combined. So we think about coastal flooding and the devastation of people um, in hurricane zones. But the sort of day in, day out stress for our urban communities in particular of living with extreme heat is the single biggest issue that we have to face. And it's a perfect tie-in to this theme of light and thinking about how we can both cool our communities while at the same time investing in and improving quality of life. And before I hand it off, I'll say we, um, our organization does a lot of work, as I mentioned, in the management of natural forests, but we just did kind of a for fun experiment this year where we had our field scientists take the temperature on one of those 90 plus degree days in a bunch of the natural parks where we were working and and then also in front of our office, which is just one block from here. And in Midtown, it was seven degrees warmer in Midtown at that exact same time as it was in Inwood Hill Park, just a few miles north. So we, we know and can measure these really real impacts. And I think we, um, we're sort of catching up with that information when we think about sort of design and, and policy setting. I think um, both of you all had a really good answer for that question, and I don't want to uh, overlap too much on what you've, what's already been said. But I do just want to uh, make a note um, to the, the question of why is the most vulnerable um, and the most underserved communities um, the most at risk for sea level rise and, 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 and also for stormwater runoff because they have CSOs in their communities. Um, they have lack of green space, um, which is helping to contribute to a lot of that. So um, we have the, the heavy heat you know, causing problems and aggravating stress, which aggravates and is a trigger for asthma. And we see this cycle of 
continuous problems related to lack of green and natural environment. And, and the mitigation efforts typically don't happen in poorer communities. They happen for the big, for the big U, right, around Wall Street for a rebuild by design, but they're not really protecting people in communities that are definitely known to be vulnerable. And I think our initiatives in terms of our strategy should be more pointed at human costs um, of lives, but also health and well-being on a daily and, uh, you know, uh, um, more of a conscious decision to, to go after not just our industry, which is the in industry that's being protected, say, in Hunts Point around the produce market because it feeds the Northeast Corridor, but what about the people who live in Hunts Point, too? And in the South Bronx, totally eliminated from part of the design, and we had to fight and advocate to make sure that part of the Hunts Point Resiliency Project was going to include Mount Haven and Port Moores, but why do we have to fight for that? Right? So that we know what happened after Sandy. We know the situation where storm waters and the sea level rise caused the, the 14th Street um, uh, power station to erupt and most of Manhattan in the dark, but we still have communities that are sitting with unmitigated, unprotected um, fossil fuel power plants and, 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 and generation stations by Con Ed, and nothing's being done. So we can't wait until there's a disaster to react. And right now, I think we're forced to be in that mindset that only the ones who were hit really hard should be putting our attention to or the threat to our, to our financial um, industries or industrial developments. But it has to be about, I think, really centered in how we protect communities. That should be our most important asset. And I don't think we're really looking at that as being the real pointed um, direction towards our focus for our emphasis on how we protect all of us and not just the industries that serve us. So I'm going to take a risk here. I'm going to take a question from the audience because it's kind of building on what you just said. Um, so the question is specific to the Playfair Coalition, which for those of you who are not aware was about um, uh, led by New Yorkers for Parks and Leave Conservation Voters and 32, no? BJ. BJ, thank, thank you, DC 37, <laughs> sorry. Uh, and which was calling for getting very significant investments in parks and not just capital investments, but also operations and maintenance investments. So, so I'm thinking about your, your position here that, Michael, that, that we, we need to be planning more forward thinking. And so the question was, what can they do? Well, the question just moved. It's gone. I got um, it though, I got the question. <laughs> well, they want to know what, what we can do next for what should the Playfair Coalition be doing next as we're thinking about, like this year we got $43 million. Uh, it was the largest increase in uh, parks budget for a very long time. And we want to make sure that that goes forward and, and how that money is spread out. But I think we have to stop creating playgrounds, mm -hmm. which are either asphalt or some sort of unnatural surface that does not do anything for heat or resiliency or permeable surfaces which will absorb storm surge or rain, right, for rain, for runoff. So, and why we're not doing it is because of the cost for maintenance, supposedly, right? But what we're doing in our community, because we have such lack there of a green space, we created a lot of community gardens, which community members steward those spaces, they work in those spaces, and we dramatically reduce the main inhibitor from parks creating more parks is the maintenance, right? So when people steward these spaces and they become very active in their community gardens, they're volunteering because they have a stake in it, because they feel part ownership in it. We need to change the model of how we, what we create and who do we create it for? Who's creating the space? And you look at our community gardens versus a, a new park that's created across the street. One's all asphalt with fake grass and the other has weeping willows and raised bed gardens and, and you know, a, a hen coop and a beehive. But everything is being maintained by the community. So how we, how we look at the next phase of in, in, investing in parks they shouldn't just be playgrounds. They have to be really permeable green surfaces and an equitable distribution access to those around the city. Well, and I think the nice thing about that is was there, a, was there is a major investment for community gardens, and that is really important. And it also helps with a different kind of resilience, right, right. and then it helps you have more locally grown foods. Um, so uh, another question that's building off of uh, the discussion that we had. Do you want to add? Yes, sorry, go ahead, um, Sarah. Playfair. So I guess I wanted to say two things about Playfair. One is people may have already acknowledged this, but I really want to say this would be a great time to give a huge kudos to New Yorkers for Parks and the entire coalition for the success of the Playfair campaign. <laughs> I, 
Having worked in the park space now for a long time, I can say this is a really huge win and I feel like we cannot celebrate it enough. Um, <laughs> specifically as it relates to kind of this question of light and resilience and the relationship with Playfair and parks, I wanted to mention that included in that $43 million was $8 million for the Green Thumb program, which supports community gardens. There was also a first year of funding, $4 million to fund the forest management framework for New York City, which is a framework that was co-created by my organization, the Natural Areas Conservancy and the Parks Department to um, steward the, the one third of our city's parkland that is natural forest areas. And there is a wetland management framework that will be coming in line over the winter. And I think um, continuing to think about these places more and more as a critical and sort of equal part of the park's portfolio and making sure that they receive the, in the investment that they need is something that I think is really valuable. And then at sort of this broadest scale, I think funding for maintenance across all of the different kinds of infrastructure that the city is responsible for managing is one of the most important investments that we can make in thinking about addressing light equity and just equity in general. And um, I mentioned this stat at a conference recently and was sort of surprised by what a strong response it got, but I think we looked, um, when we were creating the forest management framework, at the cost of doing forest restoration by different kinds of workforce, and the per acre cost for work done by contractors was about $40,000 per acre. The cost of doing work with paid trained maintenance staff was about $6,000 an acre, and the cost of supporting work that was done primarily by volunteers was $25,000 an acre. So it was closer to the cost of doing work with contractors. I think we have to encourage communities and support their interest and investment, but I think it's really irresponsible to have a mentality that we can invest in the creation of capital infrastructure, and that includes our natural infrastructure, and then pass the buck to residents, especially residents in communities that are already struggling to meet basic needs and expect them to like pick up the tab, pick up the workforce, and be responsible for maintaining these really vital things over the long term. Well, I may have to respond to that. Um, <laughs> only because uh, maybe I need to take you to our community garden in our neighborhood. Right, and I'm using that as an example. Maybe it isn't. Maybe it's not apples for apples. Maybe it's apples and oranges. But on a smaller scale, I'm not talking about the broader scale. But on a smaller, really micro scale in communities of color, like I come from, mm -hmm. the community gardens are the life and blood of our community. There, where people have birthday parties, weddings, you know, every major event that families have happen in our community garden. And when it comes to growing food and raised beds, those are the people who participate. Mm -hmm. So volunteering gets you the ability to get the eggs from the, hen, from the hens. So on a much smaller scale, which I think we have to look like, start off at a micro level and then grow bigger. But if you start with the, this, the, the, the everyday community, not trying to put a burden on the community, it's not a burden for our community, it's an asset for our community. So just to make sure it's clear that on, our, on the level of community by community's needs, mm -hmm. there has to be more of a foundational funding of those efforts to create those spaces for community. I think everyone would agree with that. I, okay. I think, I think uh, and to your point, you can't grow vegetables if you don't have light. Um, that right. is definitely one that of one so of the, right. the importance pieces of that. And I think we, we support all of that. Um, certainly the coalition does. Yeah. You should join us if, you, if Lynn didn't already rope you in. <laughs> um, so uh, spinning a little bit from that, um, and I think we can start with you, Sarah, on this one, is they wanna, folks want to know how we can address the importance of using, promoting, and advocating for native plants and the ecological health across urban environments and what that means for green infrastructure and parks. And I know that was one of the big things that, that I talked about during the Playfair campaign that Costa Constantinides talked about, Councilman, you know, because really we want to make sure that we're getting the right, the right kinds of greenery going. Um, that's a great question. 
Thanks to whoever asked it. Um, I, I have a sort of two-part uh, answer related to native plants. One is specifically related to resilience, which is there's a lot of evidence now from research that shows that um, using native plants that are sourced locally gives you a huge leg up in terms of the, um, the likelihood of those plants surviving. So New York City within the parks system has made a real commitment to sourcing and producing plants locally. The Greenbelt Native Plant Center in Staten Island produces a half a million plants a year that are used in restoration projects across the park system. And I would say that's a really, it's a great model and a model I would love to see expanded. Um, native plants are really important. They help to keep our sort of ecosystem integrity intact, which has a lot of measurable benefits in terms of supporting pollinators and um, providing sort of maximum uh, habitat for wildlife, which we really value. But I, my guess is that sort of over the next couple of centuries, we'll see that there's all of these other kind of measurable things that we're just starting to figure out how to really capture in an economic um, in an economic sense. So I just actually wanted to say that there's a couple of resources available if people in the room are interested in learning more about native plants. New York City has a native plant law which requires the use of native plants in restoration within forever wild areas. That law um, includes an appendix with a list of native plant species that are um, local to New York City. So that's a great resource if you're interested in native plants and want to know kind of what to plant. And then there's also a tool that our organization helped to create called FIRST, which is actually um, an interactive uh, web app, which allows you to answer some questions. This is for natural habitat restoration, but it, it actually creates a predictive model about the 100-year climate projection for New York City. It looks at heat and increased drought, and it gives you a suggested planting list based on where in the city you are planting. So I would also encourage folks to, to check that out, two really good resources if you are interested in using native plants in your work. I will also add that you can also get compost from New York City Department of Sanitation, and um, you can you can bring your food waste in uh, many places to be um, to be composted, which is I think really important and something that we're going to be advocating for more of us to have to do. Um, so I want to make sure I get my one last question that I had prepared before we we see if we have any more questions we can fit in from here. But what are what are the policies? that New York City needs to have in place to protect our natural communities while acknowledging that growth is going to continue? And are there, are there models from other cities, other states, other countries that we should be using to look at, or do we need to blaze our own trail? I'll start. Um, I think you, you say policies and people go to regulations, and I think we need to be careful in recognizing that regulation is a blunt tool. Um, environmental review looks at and needs to look at light impacts uh, from new development. But there's a lot that we're trying to make our buildings do. Uh, we're trying to ensure that they include affordable housing, trying to ensure that they are sustainable from an environmental standpoint, and also ensuring that they are providing sort of the, the property taxes that pay for our schools, our fire departments, um, and maintaining our park system. Um, so we also want to think about other tools that are out there that the public sector has at its disposal really to incentivize participation um, in preservation of light and the ecological benefits that that generates. Um, and I, I, I think those tools with respect to light are probably still under development, but we can be inspired by the incentives that are available for sustaining open space. So things like New York, New York City's uh, privately owned public spaces. How do we ensure that the density bonuses that those generate are providing the kind of green space and access to light that is really producing the outcomes that we want? Esplanade might maintenance agreements and similar kinds of maintenance requirements to ensure that people who are on the ground every day are actually going to be taking care of the green and being attentive to the light impacts they may be generating. Preferential assessments that re recognize um, in tax assessments preservation of open space and light. And so being creative about those kinds of tools I think are areas that merit some further exploration. 
Um, sure. So <clears throat> those are some really great concrete am answers. I was going to just um, kind of take a slightly more I don't know, long range and aspirational look. There's been a lot of conversation inspired by E.O. Wilson about the idea of designating 50% of our planet for nature. New York City currently has about 40% of our land area is some form of green space if you kind of look from the top down. And I think it would be great to think about how we could get to 50%, how we could set the kind of long range goals about the kind of city that we wanna see and live in, which includes access to sunlight, but also really a sort of deep and thorough integration of green space into all aspects of our community life. And then building the kind of both top-down and bottom-up policies that would make that kind of future possible. So we've worked really um, closely with a coalition of almost 80 partners over the last five years called Nature Goals um, 2050, and some of that, that group has created 25 measurable targets for this sort of future vision of New York City moving towards the year 2050 and setting goals like, you know, an expansion of natural areas or expansion of green space to be 50% of our land area, but also setting goals about species management and access to light that really kind of layer in and sort of fit within kind of the more traditional tools in the toolkit. So kind of combining that sort of aspiration and level of excitement and enthusiasm and then using kind of the full range of tools that are available is kind of the vision that I would love to, to see and feel sort of inspired to, to work towards. And, and actually we're seeing a little bit of that, right, with, with the buyouts that have taken place in Staten Island. Right, so following Superstorm Sandy, there were some homes that were devastated with flooding, and instead of rebuilding there, we, the, the city, the state, the Army Corps of Engineers, the Nature Conservancy, there's a whole lot of people involved, FEMA, I think they're writing the check, um, they're all buying out these properties, and it has to be maintained as open space, and will provide some flood benefits in the future. So, But let's think about it proactively and not just reactively all the time. Right. Michael, would you like to close? I just wanna, yeah, I just want to add... Um, I think we spend a lot of money in terms of taxpayer subsidies to create economic development, but we don't subsidize the development of green space. Um, we also um, aren't incentivizing development of green space before development of, hi of, of high rise buildings. We like build communities that are being gentrified. We see development happens, or you look at Long Island City or Greenpoint, you look at Brooklyn waterfront. The green space happens after development. We would love to see green space created first, but incentivize it with tax subsidies that incentivize developers to create it without building a building, right? Um, uh, it was one other point, but it escapes me. <laughs> um, but I think it's really important that we look at green space as a job creator. Um, we don't look at it as an economic driver, but we know when you do create green space, people come, entrepreneurs set up shop, we're mitigating, we're giving recreation, we're making our communities healthier, increase the quality of life. The, we're not looking at the, the, the cost benefit of creating space that people come to and recreate in when there is, especially those spaces that don't exist. Um, I do believe we should incentivize the stability of the existing spaces, but we have so much more we can do. And with the land we do have left, this public land, or even private land, um, let's use these either vacant lots or space along our peninsulas for recreational access points that would bring in a slew of benefits for the entire New York City region. And I think it can be an example that because New York City is looked at for creating examples of how we do things nationally, then let's set that stage. Let's create something outside the box. Let's create a different model. And that could be through policy. That could be through advocacy. That could be through just us saying we want something different to happen with our local elected officials and then as pertains to mayor and then governor statewide. Okay. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. That's all we have time for.